There we go. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so there is a style in between um, medieval architecture and classical architecture called the Romanesque. Um, and what the Romans did just before the medieval period, their kind of big innovation was the column. Um, no, sorry, the arch. And the reason why this was so innovative is because it allowed for much stronger, taller buildings than the typical Greek temple that we talked about last week. So a Greek temple just has a series of columns with a big triangle on the top, but the column allowed for things like the Colosseum, which is the most famous example. Slide number five, if people are using the slides. Um, so that was kind of what characterized Roman architecture. Um, and that was their main innovation. But the main innovation of Gothic architecture was the pointed arch, which allowed for much bigger spires, much taller buildings. And this you can see an example of on slide number six. So if you want to kind of figure out what Romanesque architecture is, the style that helped us transition from classical architecture to medieval architecture, um, then you need to look out for buildings that have Roman arches, but essentially look Gothic, which you can see in slide number seven. So this is just before um, the pointed arch was developed. And these buildings have always looked a bit strange for me. But when you look at something like this um, from roughly the 11th century, it kind of helps you make sense of how um, we got from one style to another. So yeah, and another interesting thing about the pointed arch, which came later and which came to characterize medieval architecture is that people actually think um, that it was sort of stolen from Islamic architecture, which had entered Spain by this point. Um, so they think that that really transformed European architecture. So this is the Romanesque. Um, it's quite a boring <laughs> style aesthetically, um, but it's important because, you know, we went from the Romanesque to the medieval, which you can see on slide number six, something like saint -Chapelle which is really one of the most amazing buildings. So, so what are we going on to now? Yeah. So basically, um, you know, they leave the Romanesque behind, they take on the pointed arch and Gothic architecture becomes more and more and more ornate, more decorative, and it looks less and less Roman. Um, but as I mentioned last week, there is this kind of, misconception that Gothic architecture is like the complete opposite of classical architecture, that they have nothing to do each other with each other, um, that one is a rejection of the other. And it's not entirely true um, because they're so close in terms of time period, like Roman architecture is the predecessor of Gothic architecture, that there has to be some kind of relationship between the two. And one of the most obvious examples of that relationship is actually in the structure of Gothic cathedrals. So if you go to slide number eight, you can see this here. So um, what medieval architects did is that they were looking for a new, uh, a new way to structure their buildings. They didn't want their buildings to look like temples anymore. They wanted to create a distinctive Christian architecture. Um, but instead of rejecting classical structures entirely, they just copied the shape of a Roman basilica. So the Roman basilica was essentially the building that the Romans used as like a town hall. So it had no religious function. Um, but medieval architects decided to use that structure, A, because it allowed so many people um, inside, so it would allow for huge congress, uh, Oh, I've got something on the chat. Um, huge conglomerations of people. Where did the Gothic style originate? <sighs> Mainly in France, I guess. This is quite disputed, but one of the earliest um, Gothic cathedrals, Cluny, is in France. So, but it kind of popped up everywhere. You've got loads of really early Gothic cathedrals in Germany. Um, somewhere it didn't start for a while is Spain, obviously, because Spain was um ruled by islamic kingdoms at this point um lots of gothic cathedrals in the uk but it's it's an architectural style that literally lasted for centuries and centuries like maybe from 
the ninth century until the 14th century. Um, so, so yeah, it pops up all over Europe. Um, I think the first one you can find though is in France. So um, back to the structure, but please do keep asking questions on the chat because it's great for me to see them. And please do ask questions if you have them. Um, so they basically, uh, they took the, the shape of the Roman Basilica and um, decided to use it not only because it was so big, but also because when you've got the bird's eye view here, you can actually see that it's shaped like a Christian cross. So for them, it had this kind of real symbolic meaning. Did you say that pointed arches were stronger? Why? Actually, you know what? That's a good question. And it's an engineering question. So maybe you can help me out. <laughs> um, there's loads of diagrams that show this basically, but you can, okay, correct me if I'm wrong structurally, but there's only so many times you can layer arches on top of each other before there's so much empty space that it would just crash through the middle. Whereas with a pointed arch, the weight is distributed to the left and then to the right. So it's stronger. Does that make sense? Sounds right. That sounds right. Okay. <laughs> that is as much engineering as I can, as I can cope with. Um, but yeah, that, that architectural development or rather engineering development made a huge difference. And that's why you can have spires now in cathedrals. Um, and sometimes what they did to make the buildings even stronger if they wanted them to be taller is add what's called a flying buttress on the side. Do you know that term in engineering? Um, it's just, I mean, you can see them on some cathedrals. I should have added a picture. But if you see a spire with kind of these strange, um, it looks decorative, like things sort of flying off the side. Um, that's actually structural to try and make it even taller. So, um, so yeah, there is this kind of idea that the Greeks were the really good mathematicians and engineers, which obviously is true, um, and that the Dark Ages or the Middle Ages and the medieval period um, weren't so um, sophisticated in terms of maths and engineering. But honestly, their buildings completely refute that because they were um, super innovative in terms of their engineering and architecture. Um, yeah, the Notre Dame, exactly, yeah, that's a good example. Um, of later medieval architecture, so super ornate um, and really two really tall spires. So yeah, that's exactly an example. Uh, I actually heard today that um, two people have been arrested for trying to steal stones from the Notre Dame <laughs> last night <laughs> um, because obviously construction stopped because of the quarantine, so they were trying to make the most of it. So anyway, Okay, so medieval architecture, you've got this really symbolic cross-like structure um, that they actually took from the Romans. And another thing that they took from the Romans is the Romans' um, ability to layer columns. So if you go on to slide number nine, um, you have these layered pointed arches, which is essentially what they managed to do in the Colosseum. Um, so that is another Roman innovation. And sometimes I think that the way in which Gothic cathedrals um, use columns is very Roman. So if you go on to slide number 10, <clears throat> number 10, which is Milan Cathedral, um, you can see here these massive columns look very Roman. And if you then go on to slide number 11, uh, this is a really interesting building from the 6th century. Um, it's a Roman cistern that was built uh, in Turkey, so in the Eastern Roman Empire. Um, and it was built to hold water, so this would have been full of water, but it was also a kind of underground safe house, like an underground palace um, for Julius, I think, not Julius, for Justinian I. Um, so you can see that these rows of columns um, went on to kind of uh, inspire the the huge um, column-like patios leading to the altar in a gothic cathedral. I'm getting messages on the chat that I'm just going to check. Can't see a button to send my comments. Can write message but no send button. If you can't send messages on the chat um, on Zoom, feel free to send them on WhatsApp because I've got it right in front of me so I can see them there as well. Um, and also feel free to message if I'm going too fast or if you have anything you want to clarify. So the chat should be working. So this is just another image, number 12, of the Basilica cistern. Um, 
it's such an amazing building and it's just underneath um or rather just to the left of and then underneath Hagia Sophia which is the building that we um talked about last week in Turkey so um so yeah oh my god thank you for these lovely messages <laughs> that's really nice so I just wanted to say this um, so that when you look at Gothic cathedrals, uh, knowing what you now know about Roman and Greek architecture, um, you can kind of try and see whether you can spot any remnants of that architectural legacy in Gothic cathedrals, um, because there are some. But having said that, if you move on to slide number 13, um, it is obviously true that gothic architecture was very different to um the classical tradition it looks very different and especially by the time you're in late gothic architecture moving into the 13th or 14th centuries um it's so ornate that it's almost um unrecognizable i mean it's definitely not roman um and some architectural historians have argued that medieval architects were basically um trying hard not to use columns and to use as much stained glass as possible in order to kind of pitch themselves as really innovative and um, no longer relying on uh, Greek and Roman engineering and kind of doing their own thing. And probably the best example of that is um, Saint Chapelle. So if you go on to slide number 14, this is, um, yeah a really really amazing cathedral in paris really really small but um really important because it's basically almost a miracle that this thing stands up <laughs> because it has so many windows like the ratio of window no of glass to stone um is so wrong in terms of engineering um that it's kind of a miracle that it still stands and um the idea that the architects had is basically to make it look like the ceiling was floating. Um, and that's why they've covered the ceiling in this dark blue with gold stars. So that it looks like the sky and all of this. So yeah, this is a really, um, yeah, this is a really amazing building. And I sometimes find, especially if you walk into this building in Paris, I find Gothic architecture a bit overwhelming, almost too decorative. Um, especially if you like classical architecture, this might seem like too much. Um, but I had a teacher who once explained to me basically that you have to try and imagine a cathedral as like the medieval equivalent of television because, um, oh, I've got a question coming in. The original glass still surviving. Yeah, 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 it is. Um, not all of it. So some people, um, some people, uh, they've had certain restoration over the years. Um, but yeah, this is the original design and interspersed there are um, bits where it's been fixed, but this is the original. Bear in mind also though that it was built over a few, um, well, more than a few decades. So even though it says 1238, the construction would have gone on until the 14th century. Um, but yeah, this was never destroyed, which is really, really amazing. Um, especially considering it's right in the center of Paris. So, um, so yeah, you have to basically think of Gothic cathedrals as the medieval equivalent of TV. So today we have more than just visual stimulation. We have mo moving, Im moving images, um, television, all of this stuff. But in that time period, people really craved visual stimulation. And this is kind of what they came up with. Um, and more than that, because nobody could read really, um, this was their way of learning and keeping themselves stimulated. So actually all of the glass that you see in this image um, tells stories, like it's all stories from the Bible. And when people would have gone to church here and at the time period and even into the Renaissance, the church service would have been in Latin, nobody could understand, nobody could read the Bible. This would have been how they learned um, stories from the Bible. So um, I, that kind of just helped me understand what medieval architecture was trying to do, because if you don't think of it that way, it kind of just seems like it's a bit too much. Um, I think I've got more questions coming in. Are all surviving Gothic buildings religious buildings? That's a good question. 
That's a good question. All the ones, all the surviving Gothic buildings that we study as art historians are, but that's kind of a shame because it's, it's just because they're the most um, ornate, I suppose. Like um, all taxes that were collected in that period were just put towards making these absolutely crazy, expensive religious buildings. Um, so I guess all other buildings that they had were purely functional and not that decorative, which seems a shame. But you have to remember that um, it's, it's really hard for us to imagine now how much people believed in God at that period. And it really would have been for them the best use of money to make buildings like this and not waste money on anything else or on decorating anything else. Um, let's see what people are saying. They look more spiritual, encouraging you to look upwards. Was that intended? Yeah, really good. Um, yeah, exactly. So the idea actually, one of the reasons why they developed the pointed arch is because they wanted it to point towards the sky for all these symbolic reasons. It would get you closer to heaven um, and all of this. And that's also why they often paint the ceiling of Gothic cathedrals with um, blue and gold stars because it has that kind of same effect, making people look upwards, making them feel like they're kind of in the sky. Um, and that was really common at the time. And actually underneath the paintings of the Sistine Chapel, um, Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel, um, there is this blue and gold painted sky um, because it was so common and he actually painted over it. Uh, another question. Would a royal patron have instigated this with the blessing of the church? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, church and royalty coming together to collect taxes and build these huge cathedrals. Um, absolutely. And um, yeah, as I say, it seems really excessive, especially if you think about the amount of labor that would have been needed to produce something like this at the time. Um, but you would spend all the money that you had if you thought, if you really, really believed that this was gonna get you to heaven. Um, so yes. And then let's see some more questions coming in. Surely some Oxbridge colleges are Gothic. Um, yeah, no, that is true also. Um, there are Gothic cathedrals. Um, for example, King's College Chapel in Cambridge. Um, is very gothic and that chapel was actually built um, over a series of three reigning kings so you can see next time if you go to king's college uh, chapel in cambridge the bottom layer of the chapel which was built by the first king is not that decorative and then you have the middle layer which kind of gets a little bit more sculptural and then you have the top layer which is this fan vaulted ceiling which is literally so ornate um, and that uh, chapel uh, kind of shows the progression of um, the Gothic style and how it became more and more ornate. The actual colleges themselves, I suppose, were built a little later. I think New College was built in Fourth. 13. Fourth All Souls. Was, um, what, do you know when it was? All Souls and New College in Oxford. I think, yeah, they are the oldest. Um, all Souls is definitely Gothic. So some of them are actually old enough. Some of the Oxbridge. 1438. Okay. And that's the oldest? No, no, because the older ones. But even so, that would be on the cusp of the Gothic style. Like, that could still be Gothic. But Oxbridge colleges after that have always... Um, a lot of them were referencing the Gothic style, even if they were in the wrong time period. Um, yeah, because of all of its kind of religious and mathematical connotations. You have a question? You might yeah. Come to it later, but why did this uh, style prevail for so long? Why did this style prevail for so long? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that necessarily. Um, maybe I guess you could say because of the dominance of Christianity now um, for so long since the Romans had become Christian way back when. Um, yeah, and also because um, it became a kind of competition in Europe to have the tallest cathedral in, um, in your country or it would have been 
in your kingdom at that point, which led to so many architectural engineering innovations. Um, so it became quite a competitive style. People wanted to get taller and taller. The Bodleian Library <laughs> is very ornate Gothic, yeah, as well. I think that may have been built slightly later. I actually have no idea and I will check. But as I say, it would have been, um, it would have been referencing the Gothic style. And actually lots of uh, Gothic buildings in Oxford are from the 19th century, really not that old, but they um, are what we call neo-Gothic, which was um, kind of Gothic revival. Um, and they're very convincing, which is like the Houses of Parliament in London. Um, that is a Gothic revival um, building as well. So I think that was also 19th century. Let me just check there's no questions on the WhatsApp. Yeah. Okay, so keep the questions coming. Um, yeah, exactly like Will's building. Yeah, exactly. So, um, what I wanted to do now, moving away from medieval um, architecture, is um, talk a bit about what happened after this. So like you say, it prevailed for so long, this architectural style, um, and perhaps too long because then what happened is that in the 15th century, um, you have the Renaissance, which is probably more familiar to some people, where people basically very simply got sick of the Gothic style and decided that having rejected classical architecture, they were going to revive classical architecture now more correctly and passionately than ever before. So if you go to slide 15, um, you've got kind of the most typical example of Renaissance architecture, St. Peter's Basilica. And I've just put it next to um, the Pantheon, that Roman building that I mentioned before, to show you um, kind of what Renaissance architects were referencing. Is Will's building Gothic or Gothic style? I am confused. So I'm pretty sure Will's building that we just mentioned is neo-Gothic or Gothic revival. Um, and that is 19th century, although it may have some original Gothic parts. As I say, it's kind of difficult sometimes to distinguish at first sight um, whether something is Gothic or Gothic revival, um, which is interesting. I can Google that actually. Can you Google it? See what... Um, it's called Will's Building in Bristol. So yeah, we can just find out. I think Will's Building was built around 1911. Interesting, yeah, so even into the 20th century. 1925 completed. 1925 completed, yeah. Gothic revival. Gothic revival. Yeah, so that's a Gothic revival building. I mean, and now that we've talked about Gothic architecture, um, yeah, you'll keep seeing it everywhere. Um, I've got another question coming in here. Will's building early 20th century, yeah. Okay, great. So going back to the Renaissance, although do keep asking questions, um, having basically totally rejected classical architecture in favor of um, this Gothic style, they went and did the total opposite, which is the story of architectural history, to be honest. Um, and um, Renaissance architects adhered really strictly to the rules of class classicism of the Greeks and the Romans. You know, the, um, the three architectural uh, columns that we talked about last week, all this stuff, they were really, really strict about it and they thought it was the supreme form of architecture. So I've always found the Renaissance a bit boring <laughs> in that sense, architecturally, because it's just, um, it's trying so hard to copy uh, the classical tradition. So I will kind of skip through it, but also because it's typically the most familiar um, style for everyone. And it kind of is the same as Gothic Revival. When you see a building, um, it's often difficult to decide whether it's Greek or Roman and whether it's Renaissance, because sometimes Renaissance architects were doing such exact copies. Um, and then it gets even more con confusing in the 19th century when you have neoclassical architecture, because then you've got, um, you know, 19th century buildings that look like they could be 15th century or 3rd century or 3rd century BC. So, yeah, it gets confusing. But um, the Renaissance was definitely the period in history when people became most obsessed with classical architecture. And I'm interested 
basically in what happened after the Renaissance, because the same thing happened, you know, as what had happened with Gothic architecture. Basically, people got sick of it. They got sick of classical architecture. Um, and this was the result. If you go to slide number 16, um, this followed classical architecture, which is the Baroque style. And it has always um, <laughs> shocked me that one thing led to another. But people just got tired of following the rules of classical architecture so strictly as they had done in the Renaissance. Um, and as I say, it's always a cycle with architectural history. And it happens slowly. If you go to slide 17, um, this is a building in Mantua and it looks classical. So it looks like it could be a good Renaissance building. Um, but the architect has very subtly started kind of not just ignoring the rules of classicism, but actually trying to like play with them and subvert them. So if you look at the line that runs above the columns, he starts to drop it in between the columns. And he actually wrote that he wanted the building to kind of look like it was falling down. Um, and if you think back to last week when we were talking about Doric columns, and how for the Greeks, this was the column that represented stability, uh, strength, you know, it's really undecorative and brutal and it's all about, um, yeah, it's all about strength and power. For this Renaissance architect to be kind of subverting that by making a building that looks like um, it's kind of half falling down is starting this trend towards rejecting the rules of classicism. Um, and this form of architecture, which is kind of between Renaissance and Baroque, is known as Mannerist architecture. Um, and if you go to slide 18, you can see kind of how this style of architecture developed in Italy, where things look classical, but architects start being a lot more playful, um, more inventive with the rules of classicism. And that is basically how we ended up with the Baroque, if you go to slide 19. Um, because by this point, um, architects were twisting columns, um, covering them in gold, painting on them, uh, basically doing whatever they wanted. So it kind of, um, it has classical forms, but it no longer adheres to the rules of the classical tradition. I'm just gonna check the questions. Um, oh, <laughs> people sending me pictures of their cats watching. I had the same last week. I really love those pictures, keep them coming, honestly. I love them. Um, so yeah, so this is Baroque architecture. Um, and I've just on slide 20 put an example of, um, I've just put the Renaissance example of St. Peter's Basilica alongside the exterior of a Baroque building, just so you can get an idea of how different these styles were and how kind of ostentatious um, the Baroque style was. You have a question? Can you talk about um, people adhering to rules? Mm -hmm. Was there anyone actually imposing particular rules mm -hmm. and were there consequences for children? Yeah, good question. Okay, so for those who didn't hear, um, my boyfriend just asked with the Renaissance architects who were following the rules of the classical tradition, was there anyone uh, writing these rules down and imposing them and were there consequences for those who didn't follow them? Um, in terms of writing them down, there was, um, I mentioned last week, um, Vitruvius, who was the Roman architect who wrote a big uh, manuscript outlining all of the rules of classical architecture. Um, in the first century AD. So it's a text that's a thousand years old and it still survives. And it's basically thanks to him that we know the rules of classical Greek architecture. We could have figured them out because when you look at Greek architecture, um, it's all the same mathematically. So they have the same ratio of column to um, entablature on the top. Um, they're often the same size, like they have really, really strict rules, but he wrote them out for us. Um, and then in the Renaissance, it was a time when they were discovering loads of classical texts, loads of Roman texts. Um, so yeah, and, and they were trying to follow them as much as possible. And it was kind of a matter of um, <coughs> pride because if you knew these rules and you followed them, it showed that you were one of the few people who was able to read Latin and yeah. And then when people started breaking them, I mean, consequences, um, 
yeah there were consequences some people hated it and wrote about it and you risked losing your reputation um and it was only when rich patrons started adopting the style that it would be that it would become accessible which is kind of still the case when you break a tradition or a or a style you know it takes a while for people to adapt um yeah good question any questions coming in on the chat no okay good well not good ask whatever you want um so yeah so this is the baroque style the interesting thing about baroque is that the word baroque actually means its original meaning was um oddly shaped pearl um that's what it meant in french and it became used to describe this architecture that was like slightly well not even slightly that was distorting the classical tradition that was irregularly shaped um so that's kind of what baroque means and if you think to last week as well when we were talking about the ottoman baroque um that also works because it's the ottoman baroque style was something that was kind of distorting classical architecture as well so that's what we mean when we say baroque um and probably the final important thing to say um about baroque architecture is that it became associated with um the counter-reformation I will just answer someone's question. Where is the building of the left of slide 20, please? I don't actually know. Um, yeah, I've labeled all my slides except this one on the left. I will do it after the class. I just couldn't find its location, um, but I put it in because it's such a good example. And it's from the right century. So I will post that on the chat afterwards. Um, but yeah, so the reason why Baroque architecture became associated with the Counter Reformation um, is because the protestants uh, i mean i won't go into this whole history but were basically uh advocating for a more um pure simple less expensive less over the top style and the catholics kind of uh went completely the other way and um made these absolutely ridiculously ornate buildings to kind of um to kind of argue in favor of the emotional intensity of art um, and the spirituality of art. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's definitely a style that has lots of um, religious and political connotations. So, and also that's why if you go to slide 21, um, you know, as I say, Baroque became associated with Catholicism, with the Counter-Reformation. So even though St. Peter's Basilica on the left of slide 21 is Renaissance on the outside, the inside, which was made, which was remodeled later, um, is Baroque. Uh, so that's, it's a great building for kind of understanding the difference between um, those two styles and the different historical contexts that they came from. So, so yeah I, this concludes kind of part one of the talk i know i've been talking for ages so don't worry the second part will not be so long um but i just didn't want to skip this because for me the most uh interesting thing about baroque architecture is basically uh where it traveled um so you can see baroque architecture literally all over the world like i said in turkey last week uh in Russia, in Australia, uh, everywhere. And the reason why it's an architectural style that traveled so widely is because we're in the 17th century with this architectural style and it coincides with the development of the world's first empires. And the one that I'm gonna talk about is um, Spain. So one place where you can see so much Baroque architecture is all across Latin America. So if you go to slide um, 22, these are just some examples of um, Spanish colonial architecture, which is Baroque architecture in Brazil, in Peru, in Mexico. Um, and Spaniards, one of the first things that they did when they arrived was um, build these cathedrals everywhere. And the one cathedral that I'm going to concentrate on, um, now is basically Mexico City Cathedral. Um, this building is so interesting. So basically, um, 
again, if I'm going too fast or if you have any questions, um, I tend to get a bit excited when I talk about colonial history and I'll probably go too fast. <laughs> um, okay, so Mexico City Cathedral. So when um, the Spanish came, massacred many, many Aztec people and started building this cathedral, uh, they decided that they would actually build it on top of the main Aztec temple in Mexico City. Um, so this building is literally on top of one of the biggest Aztec temples um, in Mexico, and you just can't see it anymore. And the reason why they decided to build it on top um, is, I mean, for the obvious reasons that they wanted to destroy, well, not obvious, but at the time they wanted to destroy Aztec culture. So it kind of, for them, uh, building it on top was one way of doing that. Um, but another reason why they did it is because um, if you go, oh, if you go to slide 24, I've just put some circles around some of the most Baroque elements of this cathedral, just so you get used to kind of recognizing these architectural elements. They're things that look kind of classical but are just a bit too much to be considered Greek or Roman. Um, so anyway, if you go to slide 25, like I was saying, um, you might recognize this as an Aztec temple. This is an, a surviving one in Mexico City. Um, Aztec temples have this very characteristic stair-like uh, pyramid and the Aztecs um, always wanted their temples to be bigger and bigger because they did sacrifices at the top of the temples and you know the taller your temple the closer it was to the sky and the gods. Um, so every time the Aztecs had a new ruler, every time a king died or was overthrown, they would build a new layer on top of um, on top of their temples and this would kind of symbolize um, the arrival of a new ruler. And when the Spanish found this out, they basically thought that if they built their cathedral directly on top of the Aztec cathedral, instead of just knocking it down, that the Aztec people would um, kind of accept them as new rulers because that would be what they're used to. So the Spanish cathedral is kind of like another layer of rulers on top of the Aztec temple. Um, so, so yeah, that's basically what they did with the with the main cathedral in Mexico City. And what they've done now, now that they're trying to uh, recover some of their Aztec heritage, is that they've built um, glass around the outside of the cathedral and excavated it so that you can look down before you go in and see some of the old um, layers of the Aztec cathedral, which is kind of amazing. Some questions coming in now. Must have taken ages to build. Yes. Um, I mean, both the Aztec temples and then the Spanish cathedral took a long time to build. Although the sad thing about colonial architecture is that often they just enslaved people to make their cathedrals um, stand faster. So often they were built much quicker than they would have been in Europe. But yeah, um, it definitely would have been a few uh, decades with Mexico City Cathedral. Um, just checking if there's uh, questions coming in on the WhatsApp, no? So yeah, um, so that's what the Spanish did when they arrived in Mexico City. That's how they kind of imposed Baroque architecture there. But when they went south, so if you go to slide number 26 now, when they went south, um, they were faced with a different dilemma because Mexico City and the northern region, regions were Aztec. But southern Mexico was Maya, and uh, it was inhabited by Mayan people with Mayan rulers. And um, Mayan religion was very different to the Aztec religion. Uh, they didn't build temples, they didn't sacrifice things uh, on top of temples. Instead, they worshipped and um, made their sacrifices inside caves. Um, so the Spanish had this dilemma because they were building these cathedrals in the south of Mexico and nobody was using them, uh, obviously. <laughs> so um, I'm going to take the case study now of one small town in the south of Mexico called San Juan Chamula in Chiapas, and it's spelt here on the slide. Um, 
they decided in this town uh, very sadly to basically block all of the entrances to the caves that Mayan people used and then they built this Baroque tem uh, cathedral that you can see and inside they painted it black and they covered it in pine leaves and they told the Mayan people that this was their new cave um, and they filled it with statues of Catholic saints and they said to them, uh, you worship many gods, these are now your many gods. And amazingly, the Mayan people um, started accepting this because it didn't necessarily change their religion. And what ended up happening is this kind of strange fusion between Catholicism and uh, Mayan religion. Um, and it's the fusion that has survived. So uh, the community of San Juan Chamula continues to use this church. Um, it continues to be covered in pine, uh, kind of pine leaves on the floor. And it continues to be painted black inside. And you're actually not allowed to take photographs of the inside, which is why I don't have any. Um, but the result architecturally of this religious fusion is basically that you've got a Baroque cathedral that is covered, if you look at the door, in Mayan religious symbols. Um, and inside you have Catholic saints um, that are worshipped with Mayan religious rituals uh, to this day. So I've got some questions coming in. Okay, no, no questions. Um, yeah, so I've, I've always found this building um, really amazing. Oh, people sending pictures. Oh, amazing. Yeah, people have visited. Um, yeah, it's really, it's really quite amazing. Um, but again, you can't uh, take pictures of the inside of this building because actually the Mayan, uh, according to Mayan religion, um, reflections in water are one of the ways that you can slip into the kind of underworld. And that's how you become ill. And that's how you become uh, taken far away from their equivalent of heaven. So they always avoid looking into reflections. And basically when they found out that... Um, when they found out that cameras use reflections in order to take pictures, they banned all tourists from uh, using any kind of photography when they visit. Um, and, it's, and it's a really important and contentious point for them because the Spanish actually introduced mirrors when they came to Mexico. Um, and for them, it was something to be really proud of, um, this kind of innovative material. But for the Mayan indigenous community, that was a massive threat because they thought that these mirrors would make them ill. Um, and they used to sacrifice uh, all sorts of animals inside this cathedral, but now they mainly sacrifice um, chickens. And anyway, there's really uh, funny stories that basically suggest that the reason they sacrifice chickens is because, um, is because the Spanish were the people who originally brought chickens to Mexico in the first place. Um, so yeah, some people saying, um, that the color is really striking and is it significant? I actually don't know. Um, I don't know, I will, I will research that. It's quite hard to find stuff out about this building. Um, but definitely uh, it's the same colors as the uh, clothes that the indigenous women of this community wear. Um, so it must have some kind of significance. And color is, uh, because I mean, we talk about Mayan religion and Mayan people, um, but there are, uh, various different groups within. So San Juan Chamula is its own, has its own interpretation of the Mayan religion. Um, and color is one of the ways of identifying um, which group you belong to. So, um, so yeah, that could be it. I have now been talking for such a long time, but I just wanted to finish. Um, I just wanted to finish with something modern, which I promised I would do last week because we haven't done anything modern yet. Um, and it is related to what we're talking about. So if you go to um, slide 27, um, I just wanted to talk about kind of where, what happened in Latin America, like how people um, have interpreted this architectural history um, where you've got, you know, Baroque architecture on one side, indigenous temples on the other, and uh, fusion architecture in the middle. Um, 
what some modern architects have started to do is kind of move away from the Baroque and move away from fusion architecture and start trying to go back to original indigenous forms and uh, incorporate them into modern buildings. Um, so I'm just gonna leave you with one example of how this is working in the present day. This is an architect called Freddy Mamani, uh, a Bolivian architect uh, from the city of El Alto. And um, El Alto is a really interesting city in Bolivia because three quarters of its population um, identify uh, as indigenous and the indigenous community there call themselves the Aymaras. Um, and so for them, Freddy Mamani's kind of modern revival architecture, which you can see also in slide 28, um, is a massive point of cultural pride um, and indigenous pride. And actually they call these buildings um, cholets, which is kind of like a parody of the chalet or the chalet, um, and also a parody of one of the racial slurs that is sometimes used uh, in a derogatory manner uh, to call indigenous people in Latin America, cholos. Um, so, so, so yeah, they're really proud of these buildings. And if you just go to slide 29, it's just to show you that he uses the colors of um, Aymara indigenous uh, clothing to, um, to make his buildings basically. Um, so yeah, so yeah, and I think these buildings are amazing. What is the date of these? Uh, really contemporary, literally um, from 2005 onwards. So, and it actually coincides with the, um, what do you call it? Election of Evo Morales, the first indigenous uh, president, prime minister, I'm not sure, in Bolivia. Um, so yeah, people are, really proud of these contemporary buildings and there's about I think um how many I wrote it down a hundred of these buildings so far and most of them are in this city um so yeah he's a really cool architect um I will leave you with that this is a particularly nice um this is a particularly nice image of them on slide 31 I've been talking for so long um Let's just check the questions. Back on now. Um, okay, great. How is the color applied? Good question. Um, when you see closer up images of them, which I should have included, um, it looks quite like plastic acrylic material, but I know it's kind of mixed media, especially if you look at the inside. Um, but I will, um, I will look more at the, um, sorry, we're just answering the doorbell. I don't know who it could be. Although, Aman, should you do it if, um, if you don't want to be in contact, no? Maybe just leave it. Sorry, everyone. We're in full isolation here because he's um, visiting his ill mother next week. Anyway, um, so I will find out um, more about the kind of material properties of these, of these buildings. So, I mean, just to kind of round up the, the session, I know we started in medieval Europe and we've um, basically ended in, in Bolivia, in contemporary Bolivia. So I know, it's, uh, I know it's, it's a bit random, but I just, I always want to introduce you to traditional art history and then show you that there's so much that it misses out and often it's the most interesting stuff. So I hope you can kind of understand where we're going. So now just, feel free to um to ask whatever questions you want about whatever period we've covered here um and we'll just and yeah we'll just see if it's helpful so someone just asked what are these buildings used for everything um honestly some of them are, flat, are flats like apartments <laughs> so and some of them are um town halls um yeah, I should have found the specifics with each building. Um, you can kind of tell some of them are flats and office buildings like this one on uh, 28 with these special windows. Um, and actually, I will just try and uh, show you um, the insides of some of them, if you can see. Yeah, oh God, this is, these are, it's just amazing, isn't it? 
this is the insight um, here. You can see them. They're even crazier on the inside. Um, so it's quite amazing. And that's the architect with his mother. So yeah, I will try and find out more about the um, material properties of them. So let's see more questions. Has there been a backlash against this architecture since Evo Morales deposed? Really good question. Um, really good question. So actually there was already some backlash to these buildings before he was deposed, um, just because um, just because some people say that um, this will make the Aymara indigenous community too dominant um, and that it um, isn't doing any favors to the more minority indigenous communities. Um, so that's one reason why people don't like them. Um, other people just don't like them stylistically because I know that uh, they have their own uh, specific style and uh, other people uh, say that they're too expensive to build. Um, but um, so yeah, even, even within indigenous communities, there is some backlash against these buildings. But generally, uh, sadly, the majority of the backlash is kind of um, from white people in Latin, in Bolivia, who, um, who are kind of threatened by this indigenous pride, which is a real shame. And that will certainly, uh, that certainly risks getting worse now that um, Evo Morales has been deposed. Um, Please, can you do a few next notes about the, yeah. Yeah, of course. So to, um, to everyone who's really enjoying these buildings, and I'm so glad, I'm really so glad everyone loves these buildings as much as I do. Um, yeah, it's, it's, they're especially nice to look at when you're stuck at home, I have to say. They really, um, they're really, really nice. But yeah, I have got a series of lecture notes on this. I've got all the notes from the talk that I just gave now. And, um, and I will put them on Facebook and on WhatsApp, um, same as last week. So anything, you know, especially when you're taking notes, don't stress because I've got all the names and stuff written down. So you'll, um, the colors inside these buildings